Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 93, The Terror of Argyll. John Tennant, Tub the Terror of Argyll, was an Australian bushranger who was active around the Canberra district in the mid-1820s. John Tennant was born in Belfast, Ireland in 1800 and was 29 years old when he was sentenced to transportation to Australia for life in 1823. He was convicted of robbery in Dublin and he left Ireland on the 13th of February 1824 and arrived in Sydney on the 12th of July 1824 on the Prince Regent. He was assigned to Joshua John Moore and joined other men, James Clark and John McLaughlin, who helped establish Moore's property, Canbury, which is where present-day Canberra is situated, and at that time was on a property at Acton in about 1824. Joshua Moore was the first European to habitate the limestone plains. John Tennant was convicted for stealing six pounds from Moore in 1826 and assigned to work in irons on a road gang as punishment. Tennant escaped the Iron Gang and lived in the Brindabella Mountains that surround Canberra. He formed a gang consisting of John Ricks, James Murphy, who also came out on the Prince Regent, and Thomas Kane. In July 1827, Tennant's gang raided Rose's outstation at the Yass River between Murray Bateman and Gunning. Tennant was shot in the back by James Farrell. During his recuperation, he teamed up with a female bushranger, only known at the time as Mrs Winter. In the Monitor on the 15th of October 1827, a female, Mrs Winter, was described as a bushranger and the lover of John Tennant. Mary Winter was born Mary Heard and appears in the convict musters and transportation records of May 1820 arriving on the Morley. She'd been tried at the Old Bailey on a charge of possessing forged banknotes with 25 others on the 17th of February 1820. Mary was transported to Australia and sentenced to 14 years. Her court records say that she sometimes used the alias Davis, and it was her first conviction. Her age in 1820 was reported as 34 years old. On the 21st of November 1827, Tennant robbed the empty hut belonging to Mr Robert Campbell, Senior Esquire of Argyll, on his property Duntroon, and stole property from the overseer at Duntroon Station, James Ainsley, and put Charles Bowman in bodily fear. Tennant, Ricks and another man held up Piagolo Station on the 21st of November 1827, robbing it of supplies and stowing them in a hollow tree. When collecting the supplies two days later, they were surprised and almost captured by the Piagolo and Canbury overseers. It says on the 23rd of December 1827, while he was absent, the tenant gang of bushrangers raided his house and stole valuable articles. A government notice was published in the Sydney Gazette on the 31st of December 1827, announcing a £30 reward and a ticket of leave to any person apprehending the members of the gang. On the 29th of February 1828, the Sydney Gazette reported the arrest and trial of the members of the gang. And the £30 reward notice states, Colonial Secretary's Office on the 27th of December 1827, £30 reward. Whereas information has been received that the house of Mr Peter Stuckey at the Wallandilly River in the county of Argyll was on Sunday last the 23rd attacked and plundered by a party of armed bushrangers who have committed numerous other depredations, and there is reason to believe that the undimensioned individuals, with John Tennant per Prince Regent, for whom a reward of £20 and a ticket of leave was offered by the government notice on the 4th of September, were concerned in the said outrage. Notice is hereby given that the sum of £10 will be paid to any person or persons who may apprehend and lodge any one of the individuals alluded to in one of His Majesty's jails. James Brown, or Brune, a Frenchman, formerly in the service of Mr Stuckey. Thomas Keane, per Sir Godfrey Webster, a native of Meath, 22. James Murphy, per the Prince Regent, a native of Dublin, 19. In late December 1827, they tortured James Farrell. Two members of the gang, Kane and Murphy, were caught near Goulburn 
and Tenenden Ricks were sited near the property Canbury by John Casey. The authorities were now closing in. On the 8th of January 1828 at 2am, Mr JJ Moore's station was stuck up by Tennant and Ricks. All the men rounded up and placed under guard. Mr Cohen, awakened by the noise, jumped out of bed, armed himself with a musket and handed another musket to his hut keeper, William Waterson. The bushrangers demanded that Cohen should open the door and come out, to which Cohen replied that he would defend his hut to the last. Tennant, whom Mr Cohen had been able to recognise, with the night being moonlight, made use of horrid oaths and violent threats and said to Cohen, if you don't come out of the hut, I will burn you out. Tennant's companion, who proved to be Ricks, called out, Tennant, fire in, what signifies the life of one or two? Tennant was as good as his word and actually set the bark roof alight on two occasions, but probably from being damp, the bark would not burn. At this juncture, Thomas Lay, an assigned servant of J.J. Moore, appealed to Tennant, saying, Don't do that, Tennant. Mr. Cohen never did you any harm. Tennant replied, Well, I will not burn the hut, but if anyone, Scotch, Irish or English, came after them, he would have their lives. The bushrangers then retired to the men's hut, where one of Mr. Ainsley's men was ordered to get them some food. Having partaken of, then the miscreants made off. At sunrise, Mr. Cohen went over to Mr. Campbell's station and reported to James Ainsley what had happened, saying it was time something was done. Ainsley's reply was short, sharp, to the purpose and characteristic of an old trooper. I will go out and take them, dead or alive. Cohen replying that he would go with him. Ainsley, hearing the two constables were at the neighbouring station, sent for and requested them to accompany him in pursuit of the gang and also obtain the services of four Aboriginal trackers. John Jones, the district constable, also joined Mr Ainsley at Piagolo before making their way to Canbury, where Constable Fenton, Mr Cohen, Mr McFarlane and others joined the party. Leaving Canbury, the trackers soon picked up the track of the bushrangers, which was followed round the north side of a hill into forest land, the track becoming quite plain and leading towards the Murrumbidgee River. After following the track for about five miles, they came to a brush on rising ground where one of the trackers named Make a Cake called out, Make a Light, meaning that he saw the bushrangers' encampment. While the party halted to arrange their plans, Ainsley, unnoticed, rushed into the tent alone and surprised Tennant and Ricks. Placing his musket to Tennant's breast, he said, You rascal Tennant, if you move, I will put the contents of the piece through your heart. At this moment, in ignorance that Ainsley was in the tent, Three shots were fired, which wounded Tennant in the neck, face and hands, and Ricks in the knee, but fortunately Ainsley escaped injury, promptly shouting, cease firing them. Mr McFarlane promptly rushed to Ainsley's assistance, relieving him of Tennant, whom he gave in charge to Constable Jones. A large quantity of stolen property was recovered, and among other articles, we are glad to know that Mr Ainsley was able to swear positively that his light-coloured vest with the pearl buttons and his nightcap marked with his initials, but with his innate Scottish caution, refused to swear to the other items as they had no particular private marks, though still believing them to belong to himself and some of his men. On the 25th of January 1828, it was reported in The Australian in Sydney, Tenant the notorious bushranger and his comrade, a man nicknamed Dublin Jack, have both been made prisoners in the new country and are now on the road towards HM Jail in Sydney. So James Murphy, Thomas Kane, William Tennant, John Ricks and Jay Jones, severally arraigned, the first four as principals in stealing in the dwelling of Mr Peter Stuckey in Argyle, and Jones for being an accessory to the others, in receiving, knowing it to be feloniously stolen, a double barrel piece, a blunderbuss, a sword, two silver watches, some provisions and a box of clothing, guilty and remanded for sentence. And Charles Campbell and John Ricks were indicted for burglariously breaking and entering the dwelling of William Shelley in the county of Argyle on the 18th of October, guilty of grand larceny and remanded. So John Tennant, John Ricks, James Murphy and Thomas Kane were convicted on the 29th of February 1828 and sentenced to hang. Jones was to be transported for 14 years. And Charles Campbell, who was tried for the burglary of the house of William Shelley, was found guilty of grand larceny and received seven years' transportation. So the details of this trial were presented in the Sydney Gazette and New South Wales Advertiser on the 2nd of June, 1828. 
at the Supreme Criminal Court on the 30th of May 1828 before Justice Dowling. John Tennant, John Ricks, Thomas Kane and James Murphy were indicted for stealing in the dwelling house of Thomas Rose. Two persons therein, namely John Farrell and Thomas Simpson, being put in bodily fear at Argyle on the 21st of December 1827. The prisoner tenant, on being called on to plead to the information, answered in the most reckless manner, guilty. Mr Justice Dowlings asked, Prisoner, are you aware of the consequences of that plea? The prisoner said, I don't care. My Lord, I am tired of myself and the system determined on it and I'm ready to die. We were tried and sentenced to death in the last sessions and I have been kept on the chain in the cells ever since and now we're brought up to be tried again. The Attorney General said, These prisoners, Your Honour, were tried at the last sessions. The present information is for another offence. Mr Justice Dowling said, Prisoner, I advise you to withdraw your plea and take your trial. You are charged with a capital offence. The prisoner said, Guilty, my Lord, I am determined to plead guilty to everything that may be said against me in this court today. After some further admonition from the learned judge, Tennant answered, Very well, not guilty if you like, and put himself upon his country. The other prisoners replied in the same way, Anything you like, not guilty, you may try us in the easiest way for yourselves. The Attorney General then stated the case to the jury and called James Farrell. James Farrell stated he was hut keeper at Mr Rose's cattle station at Argyle. On the 21st of December, four men armed came up to me as I was standing at the door with the overseer, one of whom, the prisoner tenant, desired me to stand or he would blow my brains out. I ran into the hut where he followed me and asked me if I was going to shoot him. I told him I had nothing to shoot him with, and as I turned around to call the overseer for assistance, the three other prisoners, Ricks, Kane and Murphy, came into the hut with pistols in their hands and made the overseer sit down in one corner, ordering him, at the peril of his life, not to move a hand or foot. I had no intent before. I was in pursuit of him last July and put 12 buckshots into him, but he got away. On this day, Tennant said to the overseer, now I'll shoe you for what I'm going to take that man's life for, meaning mine. He then stripped off his shirt and exhibited the marks of wounds in his back, saying, this man shot me and I'll shoot him now. He then took hold of me and told me to go down on my knees and he would give me 15 minutes to pray for my soul. I told him I would not go down on my knees for him and then he took me down towards the fireplace. I heard one of the other prisoners say, is this the rascal? to whom some answer was made, but I was in such terror at that moment that I did not know what or by whom. Tennant said, don't shoot him yet until I have done with him. The overseer said to him, I understand your name is Tennant and whatever you do, do not take life. Tennant then said that they would boy with me and not take my life. And as he had a boatswain of his own, I should have 50 lashes. They then tied me up to a post took down my trousers and Tennant ordered me to receive 50 lashes, which were inflicted by Ricks with the buckle end of a strap. And when I was ordered by Tennant to be taken down, he gave me three additional lashes. I was severely hurt and bled very much. The prisoners took an old carbine and an old musket, worth together about 10 shillings out of the hut, but they were brought back by the overseer immediately. Thomas Simpson stated, I'm the overseer to Mr Thomas Rose in Argyle on the morning of the 21st of December between 6 and 7am. The prisoners came into the hut where the last witness and I lived. Tennant asked me if I had any firearms and I told him there was an old musket and carbine. He then asked if we had any ammunition. I told him there was none except a small bit of powder which I carried in a little box in my pocket for the purpose of striking a light when in the bush. He took the box and shook a little bit of powder out on the table and desired Murphy to prime one of the muskets with it. He then directed Kane and Murphy to look out and went himself to search about the hut to see if he could discover any more arms or ammunition, saying to me, Now if I find more ammunition after what you've told me, I will serve you in the same way as I shall serve Farrell. He then told Farrell that he had a boat swaying now and having tied his hands and pinioned his arms said, Now Farrell, Recollect what I'm going to do. Farrell answered, Very well, Tennant, shoot me now. Tennant then ordered Ricks and Murphy to take a pistol in each hand and stand before Farrell. I begged of Tennant not to take life, and he said, As you have begged his life, will child flog him. They then tied Farrell to a post 
and having let down his trousers, Tennant said to Ricks, Now you, Boatswain, do your day, flog him and give him fifty lashes. Ricks took off the leather belt which he wore around his waist, which had a buckle at one end, and wrapping the small end round his finger, flogged Farrell with a buckle end. Farrell suffered very much. The blood flowed from the wounds inflicted by the buckle, and having in his struggles loosened himself from the cord that bound him to the post, he fell on the ground and Ricks continued to flog him in that position. After the flogging, they would not suffer him to button up his trousers, but made him sit down naked on a form. Tennant, when they were going away, examined the musket and carbine and told Murphy to take them out with him. I asked him not to take them away, but he said it was a rule with him to take all firearms, but that when they went from the hut, the arms should be left at the back of the stockyard at the top of the hill, and I could bring them back again. Before they went away, Murphy asked if we had anything to give them to eat. I pointed to some bread on the shelf and a pot which contained three pounds of meat. Tennant said to Murphy, don't take it, they are short of provisions. Murphy swore he would have some and Tennant pointed out to him how much he should take. He cut a piece off and put the remainder in the pot again. Kane, Murphy and Ricks went away first. Tennant stopped behind a little while after them and told Farrell that he had another gang of ten men in the bush and that he would send them to serve him the same way he had done. I followed them out of the hut to the top of the hill and asked Tennant if I might take the musket and carbine, which were then lying against the stump of the tree. He said, yes, take them away and I brought them back to the hut. They were Mr Rose's property. I never saw the prisoner afterwards until they were apprehended. There were five or six shirts and some boots and trousers in the hut, together with household furniture, such as knives, forks and spoons. The prisoners made no attempt to take any of these things. Tennant told the others they may not touch anything. I think the object of the prisoner in coming to the hut was to have revenge on Farrell and not commit a robbery. Mr Justice Dowling summed up the evidence and told the jury that the information against the prisoners was framed on the Act of Parliament of the 7th and 8th George IV, which rendered stealing to any amount in a dwelling house when the inmates were put in bodily fear as a capital felony. The question then for their consideration upon the evidence before them was, did the prisoners come to the hut where the transactions as described by the witness took place with the intention to commit robbery or merely to wreak their vengeance on the witness Farrell? because however they might be answerable to another charge still, if the jury were of the opinion there was no intent to commit a robbery, or that the firearms stated to be removed from the hut in the manner described by the witnesses, were not so removed with the intention of being converted to the use of the prisoners, they would use, in point of law, be justified in finding a verdict of guilty upon that information. The jury retired for a short time and returned into court with a verdict of not guilty. Mr Justice Dowling said... A very proper verdict, gentlemen, under the information. Mr Attorney General, these men must be detained to answer for the most atrocious assault. The prisoners were accordingly remanded. So John Tennant, John Ricks, Thomas Kane, and James Murphy were imprisoned for five months for the violent assault on James Farrell. On Wednesday the 9th of September 1829, so a year later before Mr Justice Dowling, John Tennant, John Ricks, James Murphy and Thomas Kane were indicted for stealing in the dwelling house of Robert Campbell Senior Esquire at Argyle on the 21st of November 1827, putting him in bodily fear. The jury found Tennant and Murphy guilty of larceny, but Ricks and Kane not guilty. So John Tennant, Thomas Kane, John Ricks and James Murphy each received for larceny seven years transportation. Murphy was found guilty of another larceny and got seven years additional commencing at the expiration of his first sentence. So basically what all that meant was that the death sentence was commuted and the men instead were sent to the notorious penal colony, Norfolk Island, for a seven-year sentence. And James Murphy received a further seven years at Norfolk Island for the other larceny charge. The colonial secretary warned the commandant of Norfolk Island that the men named Long the Terror of Argyle and the surrounding country are now forwarded and I am directed to point out to you for your information their extreme desperation in order that you may be aware of their characters. After serving time on Norfolk Island, Tennant returned to Sydney on the 13th of September 1836 and then was moved to Hyde Park Barracks on the 16th of September 1836 and Tennant died on the 29th of August 1839 in Windsor Jail in New South Wales and he was only 39. James Ainsley later received a grant of 100 acres as a reward for assisting the capture of the bushrangers. 
In the Brindabella Mountains, there is a Mount Tennant that is named after John Tennant, and Canberra legend has it that Tennant's loot is still hidden on Mount Tennant, waiting to be discovered. So a little on John Tennant's accomplices. Well, the first mention was James Brown or James Brun, a Frenchman, formerly in the service of Mr Stuckey. He was part of the group that broke and entered into Robert Campbell's house, stealing brandy from Robert Campbell's store on the 27th of February 1830 under the name of James Brown. And he was sentenced to two years imprisonment on board the Phoenix Hulk and there to be kept to such labour as may be allotted to him at the discretion of the governor. And after that, I lost track of James Brune or James Brown, owing to his very common surname, it was very difficult to ascertain records between one man and another. Thomas Keane, who came out on the Sir Godfrey Webster and was Irish, he was born in 1805, he came out in 1826 and he actually got his Certificate of Freedom on the 9th of March 1839 after his sentence. James Murphy, who came out on the Prince Regent with Tennant, he was Irish, born in 1808, he was only 16 when he arrived and he was a jockey before coming out and getting a seven-year sentence. He was initially signed to Willoughby Bean in Phillips Street, Sydney, when he came out in October 1824. And after serving his sentence on Norfolk Island, he got his Certificate of Freedom on the 20th of March, 1830. John Ricks, spelled R-I-C-K-S, also R-I-X, but he was also known as John Rakes, and under the name Dublin Jack. He was born in 1807, and he was a labourer when he was tried at the Sussex Quarter Sessions. He received seven years transportation. He came out on the Norfolk and arrived in New South Wales on the 18th of August, 1825. After his time at Norfolk Island, he received his Certificate of Freedom on the 9th of April, 1838, under the name John Rakes. However, on the 22nd of March, 1845, John Rakes and John Hawkes were committed to his trial for robbery and horse stealing. And more on the elusive Mrs Winter. On her arrival in Sydney in August 1820, Mary Heard was indentured to emancipist Robert Winter, sometimes referred to as Winters. Robert Winter had been sentenced for life on the 7th of March 1812 at York and he came out on the fortune in 1813. He was a groom at the time of his conviction. He'd been born in 1797, so he was 11 years younger than Mary. He received his ticket of leave in the same year he arrived and he was indentured to Captain Walker in 1813. He had been referred for good conduct and being a good and faithful servant. However, his certificate of freedom was not granted until 1845. He also served under Nicholas Bailey Esquire for six years. There was a petition by Nicholas Bailey for mitigation of his sentence that was lodged in January 1819. Robert Winter worked on a small lease holding at the Nepean River and he requested to marry Mary on the 1st of August, 1821, and they married in that same year at Castlereagh. On September the 9th, 1826, Robert Winter was arrested for burglary, and he served time in a hulk until he was released on the 27th of November, 1826. Virtually as soon as he was released, Robert and Mary Winters and John Hancock were arrested for the theft of bags of flour from the nearby Cranebrook homestead, of entrepreneur Samuel Terry at Mount Pleasant. Robert Winter was sentenced to hang, but Mary and John Hancock were acquitted on the grounds of insufficient evidence. He must not have hung as he received his ticket of leave in the Maitland area on the 11th of July 1839 and was recommended for a conditional pardon in 1844, which he received on the 13th of August 1845. As the Winters had been living on the bank of the Nepean, opposite Emu Plains, where Tennant was working in an iron gang, this is likely where Mary had met up with him. Tennant had absconded the month before Robert Winter had been in the Hulk from September to November 1826. So it's believed that after her release, when she was found to be not guilty, Mary Winter bolted and joined Tennant's gang some time before Tennant was shot by Farrell in July 1827. So in 1827, she would have been 41 and Tennant 27. It was reported that he was with Winter at a camp somewhere near Gundaroo. During this period, Tennant's gang that included Dublin Jack, James Murphy and Thomas Kane committed a robbery at Goulburn without him. 
And it's at both these times in that year of 1827 that it's suspected that Tennant had commenced the relationship with Mary. On the 15th of October 1827, there was an article stating, There are at present roving about, at the further extremity of the county of Argyll, beyond Lake Bathurst, a male convict and a female, both bushrangers. The man's name is Tennant and the woman's Winter. Tennant is said to have shot a black in the groin, by which incident the justice in Argyll became acquainted with his haunts and a constable with black natives went in pursuit. The constable, being in advance of his party on the banks of the river, 200 miles from Sydney, we believe Yass River, where he saw Tennant fishing. Tennant quickly armed himself with a loaded musket, giving his doxy, his lady, charge of the fishing apparatus. The constable also had a musket. Who are you, said the constable. While I'll tell you who I am, I am Tennant the bushranger and have got two eyes. You have only one. The constable had lost an eye. And if you don't lay down your musket and go about your business, I'll instantly put out your remaining peeper. The constable was daunted. He laid down his musket to the victoring conqueror and was suffered to depart in peace and find his black comrades. Tennant, with Mrs Winter, as she's called, was not again to be found. At another time, Tennant and company made their appearance suddenly at the door of a hut containing seven men at dinner. The woman shooed them a brace of very clean pistols, telling them that her friend Tennant would honour them by using their mill for an hour to grind some wheat, and that in the meantime, if they would not proceed to the door and keep their seats quietly, she would not shoot any one of them. The fellows, partly amused and partly frightened, made no attempt to bolt, and so Tennant ground his wheat, and afterwards they both made a sudden retreat. So this second known incident involving Mrs Winter was at a robbery at a mill with an unknown location. It could have been either of two of outermost commercial mills, Minto or Windsor, or there was a small operation set up in an outbuilding at one of the larger pastoral stations in County Argyll, which is the most likely one. On the 11th of May 1831, Winter was jailed in Sydney and she was sentenced to the female factory for one year. And then on the 23rd of January 1833, she was sent again to the female factory. A week later, on the 30th of January 1833, it listed the runaways apprehended up to the 28th of January. Mary Winters from Mr A. Rutledge. So she had been billeted out and had absconded. Despite this, two years later, Mary received her certificate of freedom on the 15th of April 1835. She married Henry Hawthorne that year in Bungonia, New South Wales, and she would have been 39 at this time. The same year that she married Henry Hawthorne, she was actually given a small parcel of land. So Mary Ann Hawthorne, two acres, 12 perches at Maroolan. Only 12 months after their marriage, James Quinn put a notice in the newspaper, Caution. Where is I, the undersigned, hold written documents executed at Sydney on the 24th day of October, 1835, by Mary Ann Hawthorne, with the consent of her husband, William Hawthorne of Maroolan, in the county of Argyll, by which are conveyed and made over to me 15 head of cattle, depasturing at Mr Humes's at the Fish River, 6 head of cattle at Mr Barber's station at Yass, with their increase as security for a debt due to me by him of £69, 14 shillings and 2 pence, and by which documents I am empowered to remove the said cattle at any time I may think proper and sell them for the liquidation of my debt at the expiry of six months from the above-mentioned date. Now I hereby caution the public generally not to purchase or make any advances on the said cattle, as I shall take possession of them, wherever they may be found. And then on the 18th of April, 1836, 12 months after their marriage, notice, the public are hereby cautioned not to harbour, conceal or give credit to my wife, Mary Ann Hawthorne, as I will not be responsible for any debt or debts she may contract. William Hawthorne. And again on the 23rd of May, a month later, 
Caution, whereas my wife Marianne Hawthorne has thought proper to elope from me, I hereby caution the public not to agree with bargaining or purchasing any land, horses or horned cattle, or any part or parcel, goods or chattels, as I will not sanction such bargain or sale, either by oral or written authority. William Hawthorne. Two years later, on the 8th of February 1838, Marianne Hawthorne publishes a statement as an advertisement. Madam, it is long since I addressed you, and never before through the medium of a newspaper, and doubt not that these lines will be less welcome than they else had been. Still, I have a Christian feeling, though it has been much abused. Look back, look forward, and you will see a back door in most families, and cast not dagger remarks upon the unfortunate by saying, when you learnt I passed your residence, I had gone to the dogs, like many more. I deny it, both in public and private, for since my separation from William Hawthorne, I have paid my way, and that with hard earning. I owe nothing and want for nothing, and what can you say any more? I am, madam, yours aggrieved, Mary Ann Hawthorne, to Mrs Styles Argyle. So she decided to put it out there for everybody to know that Mrs. Styles had spoken to her in a harsh way. Now, it seems around this time that Mary had involved herself with a group of men that it seems have created a bit of a horse thieving ring. So some of these men involved in this ring are Charles Bennett. He's also known as Red Tim, the Trotter. And he is also associated with Bill West and Jingery Jack. Jingery Jack is also known as Opossum Jack and Big Jack. And there is a man that is going to be mentioned called Galvin. It seems there is a direct link between him and Mary Winter. So you'll see a range of these names mentioned in the next few articles, just so you can gather a picture as to the connection with Mary Winter and what they're up to in the region that she's living in. The 29th of May, 1839, Braidwood Courthouse, £10 reward. Whereas Charles Bennett, alias Wilson, a runaway prisoner of the Crown, known by the following appellations, Red Tim and the Trotter, effected his escape on the 5th of May out of a hut in Budjong Creek, whilst under charge of two constables for the purpose of being forwarded from Braidwood to Bungonia. A reward of £10 will be paid to any persons or persons who may lodge the Charles Bennett in any of Her Majesty's jails. Charles Bennett, alias Wilson, came out on the Waterloo, a life sentence, 35 years old, 5 foot 5, sandy hair with red whiskers, hazel eyes, a cocked nose, When he effected his escape, he wore a blue round jacket, cord pantaloons with a white fur hat and a red cravat. So Charles Bennett was convicted at Guildford for cattle stealing and he was transferred initially to Norfolk Island for five years. He had further convictions at Sydney on the 20th of May 1840. He had received a sentence for horse stealing, which became a 10-year sentence, and then he was transported to Van Diemen's Land on the Lady Franklin, which arrived there on the 12th of October, 1845. He was placed on the Port Signet Station Gang for one year. He emerged from the gang on the 15th of May, 1846, and his indent record in Tasmania stated he was a single man, Protestant, he could read and write, His trade before transportation was a groom, he was aged 40, and his native place was Oxford, England. He received his ticket of leave on the 20th of October, 1846, and his conditional pardon on the 4th of December, 1849. So in November, 1839 in Braidwood, says, Last week I had the satisfaction of seeing Master Jingery Jack and one of his associates named Bill West lodged in the Braidwood lockup. These fellows in company with another called Red Tim, whom our police are at present in pursuit of, have carried on horse stealing on a most extensive scale for the last five years in this part of the country, selling them at Port Phillip and elsewhere to the tune of some thousands of pounds. But I hope that their career of plunder is at an end. Last week, three bushrangers armed visited an establishment of a gentleman near Lake Bathurst. His name I will not mention, as he is in Sydney at present, and might on learning this circumstance be more alarmed than the nature of the case requires. 
it is quite certain that they used the most brutal violence towards a female domestic. After continuing there in the greater part of the night, they decamped laden with plunder. And on the 29th of November 1839, the famous Jingery Jack is again at large. He was forwarded from Braidwood to Goulburn, and when forwarded from thence to Berrimer, he effected his escape from the constables. Such constables ought to be brought to strict account for their conduct, as it's quite certain that Jingery Jack and his associates possess ample means of bribing them. And on the 2nd of December 1839 at Maroolan, detachments of the Mounted Police have passed during this week towards Goulburn. A few days ago, a Goulburn constable was escorting Opossum Jack's helpmate, who'd been convicted for trial towards the Wangello lockup. By some means, as yet unexplained, the prisoner got rid of his handcuffs, knocked the constable down, took away his firearms and extra handcuffs and went to Bungonia, where he requested a meal of the constable stationed there, which was given to him. He informed the Bangonia constables he was a Goulburn constable in search of Opossum Jack's mate and, of course, was kindly entertained. On the 23rd, a letter was received from Malonglo, from which the following extract is taken. I'm happy to inform you the Braidwood Mountain Police have at last fallen in with and apprehended, after a chase of three years, Big Jack and Bill West, two of the most notorious horse stealers in New South Wales. They were taken at Mrs Simpson's, an unlicensed squatter, unnoticed by the land commissioners. If what I have heard of the confessions of these worthies be true, a few of the lawless set reside about here will not rest on a bed of roses. Gelvin also has been taken and committed for horse stealing. In his case, the older age has been fully verified. Gelvin was taken at Greenwoods. It is strange that the Commissioner of Crown Lands has never thought of inquiring by what authority Greenwood occupies the land he resides on. Galvin has sold horses lately to the amount of £600. The report says Hamilton at the Snowy River was a purchaser amongst others. Galvin wished to get possession of the order or cheque for the above sum, but he could not obtain a messenger to go to the woman he lived with, who had it in her possession. No doubt she will stick to it. I think the order alluded to ought not to be paid either to Galvin or his woman, noted to be Mary Ann Hawthorne, until the horses that were sold have been produced by the purchasers and who knows to whom they may have belonged. I, as well as others, sincerely hope that the capture of these men will be the means of speedily breaking up the many improper characters with which this place abounds. So two weeks later, on the 18th of December 1839, the Braidwood Troopers succeeded in breaking up a nest of notorious horse stealers. Some of them, West and Big Jack, have been committed. One other, Garvin, still remains at Goulburn, no prosecutor having come forward. Note, it is said that Garvin is suspected to have bolted to South Australia, not without funds, which are said to have been supplied by him by a certain female, on condition he would keep out of the way. On the 20th of December 1839, reporting from Yass, it says, My information was wrong when it was said that Gelvin had gone to Sydney under escort. It was his woman who went down, per mail, under the futitious name of Mary Winter, to engage a lawyer to proceed to Goulburn and to frighten the magistrates to consent to release Gelvin. It now appears Galvin's prosecutor has gone either to Port Phillip or South Australia, well equipped for this journey. The query by the writer is, who paid the expenses? And then on the 27th, so a week later, 27th of December 1839, a celebrated person named Garvin, who was apprehended on charge of horse stealing and placed in the Goulburn lockup, has been admitted to bail. The principal witness against him, it is said, has made himself scarce. It is said that the charms of money have been all-powerful in this case. And there wasn't anything about Mary Winter or Mary Hawthorne until 1843. And there is a marriage record of a Mary Hawthorne marrying John Bettridge in 1843 in West Maitland. However, I'm not 100% sure that it is the Mary that we're looking for. And nothing more is known about Mary Winter or her identification as Mrs. Winter of Tennant's gang. She may have died. There are records on Ancestry saying she died in 1845. However, there are no detailed official records to substantiate this. 
She could have changed her identity, married again, or simply found a quiet life and remain undetected in the colonial records. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch. And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes.